The following message is from Grace Point, an evangelical free church in Tucson, Arizona. We pray that you'll be encouraged and challenged by the Word of God so that you trust fully in Jesus Christ. More information is available at our website, www.gracepointtucson.org. Good morning. Yeah, let's get that feedback addressed before I, before I begin. <clears throat> So, you saw the text. <laughs> Randy thought he had a hard text last week just mentioning dis- discipline, but I get the text that goes into the gritty details of what that disciple discipline is calling for. So, <clears throat> this morning the writer of Hebrews gives specific examples of what laying aside those sins that so easily entangle us are. In verse 4 of this chapter, our struggle is compared to sin. And he asks, have we been resisting sin in your life to the point of shedding blood? It's rhetorical. When we are thinking of quitting, we are to consider Christ literally going to the cross and reflect, is my struggle really that bad? From there, we looked at the needed discipline that a child requires. And so today we're, more, we're looking, how are we to be disciplined? What does that look like? Well, verse 14 Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So we're learning, we're to learn to make peace. Strive. Why does it say strive? If we're talking about peace here, shouldn't strife be pretty far from necessary? I remember when I was a little kid, did any of you guys know what gospel bill is? No. Okay. Well, when I was a little kid, we watched this little, this show called Gospel Bill. And it was for children's church. And I remember there was the, the word of the day was strife. And don't let there ever be strife in your life because strife is bad. Well, here the word of God is telling us to strive after something. The, but we think about the easiest way we know to keep peace is the opposite of strife, right? Just keep your mouth shut. Just keep to yourself. If you can't say anything nice, right? Don't say anything at all. We have developed a way of avoiding any kind of trouble and never raising a fuss. Americans are great at keeping their feet up. But I think some Christians have, des- have developed this idea of piety, where if I'm, in no- if I'm not in ex- external conflict in it with anyone, then I must be having peace with all. I must be doing all right. But what if you're just holding back and refusing to grow? See, this is why it says, strive for it. Yes, you ought to be at peace with everyone, but real peace, not superficial surface level ceasefire. Real peace. That might require some work. <laughs> Romans 12, 18 says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. And we would usually say, well, that's up to them, right? They need to earn it. They need to go first. They need to repent. They need to make amends. Do you know what they did? We have to understand, Christians, this text is talking to us this morning. You go out there and make it right. You strive for peace. And it gives this warning. If you do not, you will not see the Lord. Your picture of the Lord will be skewed. Your picture of His people will certainly be skewed. You know, I have seen people refuse to work through their issues blaming others and continue to not deal with things personally, and then eventually they leave. They won't deal with it. They certainly won't strive for peace, and they take the easier route. I will just stop going to church before I work through something difficult. I have my justification all right here, ready to share with anyone on social media. And in fact, as soon as I'm gone, I will. Have we, any of you guys, seen this before? The Word of God is telling us over time, if we're not seeking peace, our vision of God will be skewed, clouded. You know, I've said before that the church should be the best conflict resolutioners in the world. We should be the best forgivers around. And if not, I wonder, do we really understand the gospel? Do we really understand that we have been forgiven ourselves? The text goes on, mentioning bitterness. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, not blessed are those with whom others have made peace. Speaking of the Beatitudes, Randy said it well last week, peace and holiness go together. Think of the great command. Love the Lord your God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, but you also have to love people. Dang, I wish I could just do the first, right? 
But God puts those together. He wants peace if you want holiness. Speaking of the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, it, blessed are the pure in heart. And it says the same thing, for they will see God. See, Jesus is telling us here, if your heart is not right, it will distort your vision of God. See, if there's something going on inside, affecting your relationships, culling all the other people off, you're full of unforgiveness or lust, greed, or if you're envious, that will come out. And if you lack holiness, your peace will be lacking as well. See, if purity is not a concern for you, I would submit to you today that you're doing Christianity wrong. And an impure heart is always going to have a darker vision of God. So the, the first fill in the blank today is do not let your vision of God get cloudy. Purity. I am pure before, because God made me so. God is my source. I am not to make myself clean, we might say. Well, certainly. But we're talking about justification there. What does the Christian life look like after we are saved? Do we just keep using that excuses and never change? Or do we become something that God is calling us to become? Let me read 1 Thessalonians 4.3. For this is God's will, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. And therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Think of it this way. Imagine you had a lawyer or a police officer or a judge for a father. And you knew that if you got in trouble, they could get you off. Do you think for a moment that that father therefore desires a son or daughter who totally disregards the law and becomes a criminal? <coughs> See, I wonder if sometimes we treat God this way. Well, he's forgiven my sins. He's paid it all, so I can just kind of do my thing. Or does God want followers who care about purity? righteousness, holiness, and making peace. I think if that is our view, we might just be disregarding God here. See, we need to stop thinking in either terms of God has done it all and therefore I don't do anything, or, either or, or both and. God is both my righteousness and he calls me to live as a righteous person. Now again, we're not earning, it's just a result of our justification. God makes us new, and so we live out that new life. I am to walk in the light as he is in the light. And this text and many others tells us to strive for it. God's will is your sanctification. And so walk in it. Walk after Jesus. A disciple trains himself like the master. Because if not, you might just be disregarding God. But you might also be failing to obtain grace. Look at the next verse. 15, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and by it many become defiled. See, we are, to, we are to help each other reach maturity. Listen to what it says. Are you lacking peace, not concerned with holiness? Then not only will your vision of God be cloudy, but you, you are disregarding God, but you might actually be missing grace. How many of you guys would like more grace in your life? I would. <laughs> I would. So I need to pay attention to these things. Am I making peace? Am I pursuing holiness? Am I caring about the things that God has called me to care about? See, I fear that sometimes in Christianity we reduce it to slogans. Jesus loves me. He paid it all. No weapon formed against me. It's like, yes, that's very true. But the Bible is a very, very big book. And there are many truths that also kind of prick us. They don't, they don't, it's not always a warm hug when I'm reading this. Sometimes it's like, ouch. I need to get my act together. I need to live by the Spirit of God. See, when something in our heart is distorting our vision of God, maybe, maybe the way I'm viewing His Word is off. Perhaps I'm disregarding my sin. Perhaps I'm disregarding His people. Do you see how we will not so readily receive from God if we are suspicious of His body? Speak, seek peace with everyone. Pursue holiness. And it tells us, if we don't get this, what can spring up? Bitterness. Bitterness. See, if we leave this stuff unaddressed, not only will we not see God clearly or receive His grace, but we will begin to change. We will become bitter. Have you guys ever had to try to have a conversation with a bitter person? 
They're blaming, making excuses for their, they're dismissing their own behavior. Every opinion, every discussion is always about that one thing. And they're trying to color your opinion of that situation. It's poison. And poison quickly spreads if it is not addressed. And this text tells us it will spread and cause trouble. And by it, many will become defiled. It affects the others. It affects all of those around us when it is not addressed. Let me pause here for a moment. I want to suggest that this is the very thing poisoning America today. Instead of remembering grace for one another, pursuing peace, and desiring personal holiness, we are dealing out the results of our, our fallen vision of God and our bitter hearts. I feel this way, I am angry, and I'm going to tell everyone else about it. We're exporting our grievances to everyone, our covetousness, our prejudices, our bitterness, and we're exporting it to culture at large. And I think that that's pretty clear. As we stop pursuing peace and stop caring about holiness, we enter into this vile emotion. See, if we don't understand that the call of the gospel is to a rebellious heart, then ha perhaps we might decide, well, culture must have the answer. And culture says we just need to understand one another. We just need to feel what one another feels. See, I believe there's a, right now, right now the primary virtue out in public right now is empathy. And empathy is good. But it should not be unexamined blanket empathy. Because then we're just feeling what everyone else is feeling. And why do you think everyone's so angry? If someone feels strongly, then they must be in the right. The rest of us just need to stoop down and enter into that, into that feeling and really understand. If someone is hurt, then someone must have hurt them. If someone is angry, then someone must have done something to them. If someone is raging in the streets, then there must be injustice. If some guy feels feminine, well, they must be a female. If the faith feels difficult, then maybe I should just leave it. Because my feelings are paramount. But what if they are simply coddling and acting out their sinful, twisted desires? See, we need a metric to discover the difference between truth and the emotion that everyone is feeling. See, this text here, this specific verse, is a quote from Deuteronomy 29, 18. They refused to follow God, and they were filled with bitterness. And what did the Israelites keep wanting to do? We're going to turn away from God. We're going to bring everyone with us. We're out of here. This is hard. We're going to go a different direction. And it spread to the community. And it was not addressed. Romans 1, 24 through 26 says, Therefore God gave them over to the desires of their hearts to impurity for the dishonoring of their bodies with one another, because they exchanged the truth for a lie and they worshiped the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, and it goes on to describe homosexuality and the defiling of ourselves because we are interested in pursuing our, our desires and not what the Word of God says. Psalm 81, 12 says, But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me, so I gave them over to their stubborn hearts. How would you know if your affections are vile or not? the Word of God. What does the text say? Bitterness is a, is a poison that will follow after an impure heart that is not at all concerned with righteousness and peace. See, I do not adopt someone's grievances. I help them to the light. You should never simply adopt another's emotional weight because that emotional weight needs to be evaluated first. We weep with those who weep for sure, but I don't weep as everyone else weeps. If you want to actually help someone, watch yourself. Listen to Paul writing in Galatians 6, 1-5. through Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. But keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each one will have to bear his own load. I can help you, but I can't take it on for you. We ought to help one another. We ought to bear one another's burdens. But it has to be to fulfill Christ, right? Of course you should help. The text says, see to it. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. See, most of us are like, well, I have stuff going on in my life and I don't want to share it with anyone because I'm scared. 
No, this should be a, a place where we are bearing one another's burdens and helping one another obtain the grace of God. But we have to make sure that we're remaining spiritual while we do this. Sometimes we keep things to ourselves and we never find restoration. And of course, as the text says, you do it in gentleness, but watch out for yourself because you too can be tempted. Help one another reach maturity. You too can be tempted with the very things you're trying to lend aid for. Do not think that you are so strong that it won't affect you, as the text tells us. Neither get so involved that you take on their load, becoming burden, and sharing and exporting that bitterness as well. And especially so beware when if it's a distorted emotion that they're going through. Some might say, it hurts when you tell me I'm in sin. You just don't understand how I feel. You don't understand my temptation. And the world's solution is, you're right, I should go with you to the strip club and understand. I can help you overcome your temptation. Like, no. We understand how foolish that is in certain situations, but when it comes to other people's poisonous emotions, we don't take the same safeguards. That stuff will spread easily. And we live in a bitter America today. I can give you an understanding hug without taking on the same anger you have. I can lend you a compassionate ear without adopting your bitter experiences. I can give you an understanding nod without needing to feel your feelings for you. Proverbs 4.23 says it this, like this, Above all else, guard your heart or keep it with all vigilance. For from it flows the things of life. Do not enter into another's sin. So you are there to help restore and reconcile, not necessarily to make them feel better. Because they might need to actually repent of their heart's response. So stop the bitterness. Don't let it spread. Because I believe true, truly feeling better comes from restoration in Christ, not with false band-aids. And so here's the point. Sin easily spreads, so guard your hearts. Sin easily spreads, guard your hearts. Verse 16, speaking of strip clubs. See to it that no one is sexually immoral or unholy. That verb carries over on these two passages. See to it that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. We might be tempted to say, what sexual immorality with regards to Esau? I don't remember that in the story. This is comparing his selling of his birthright to prostitution the trading of some commodity for personal pleasure or gain. Esau, for a moment of passing desire for food, sold his birthright. Now, I don't personally always get this right, but at night when I'm tempted with chocolate, I say, no, I'll just have some water and go to bed. A moment on the lips, a lifetime on the hips, after all, right? <laughs> but this is what is so wrong with prostitution. And this is what is so wrong with sexual immorality and sex outside the marriage covenant. This is what is so wrong with adultery. This is even what's wrong with gluttony. You want, we aren't interested in self-control. We would rather be ruled by how we feel, our emotions. You can give and take whatever you want according to your desires and not according to God, and that is the problem. That is 21st century America. I will take what I want, how I feel. You know, I, I really like learning, reading and, and, and going through church history and it's our heritage after all. But there were some dark times. I was reading through the period of church history where the papacy had really infected the church between a period of 950 to 1050. And you know what it was called? It's called the pornocracy. When I heard that, I had to do a double take. It's like, is that some like highfalutin theological word that I don't... No, it means pornocracy ruled by prostitution. That's what a period of the church was called. And it wasn't like they had porn like we had today where they're digital Im images tantalizing everyone. It was just, I'm going to sell you this office. I will sell you a pope. I will sell you a bishop. And in the meantime, I will have as many concubines, women on the side, as I desire. This was the church. And so illegitimate heirs were being born and then they were being sold offices in the church. And over time, this develops into selling of indulgences. Give me money and we'll, we'll pay off your sin, your time in, in purgatory. Think of the sons of Eli in the Old Testament. They were doing the same thing. Think of this as what Jesus is addressing with the money changers. We are profiting off of the house of God. 
And this is what Esau did, and this is why his sin is being compared to sexual immorality here. We are to avoid the temptations of the flesh. That is a big thing in our country, and it, frankly, it is a big thing for humankind. <clears throat> Have you guys noticed how this is such a primary sin in the Bible? You might say, all sin is the same. Sexual sin isn't any worse. Are you sure about that? Sexual immorality is the practice of a ex practical expression of idolatry. It's a heart that's not interested in peace with God and certainly not holiness. Marriage is the primary picture that God has given us of his own covenantal faithfulness. Let's look at this. Ephesians 5, 29-32. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. For no one ever hated his own... Wait, did you... <laughs> Sorry, it's not up there. There it is. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. We are supposed to be having a picture of the way God treats us and views us in marriage. It's not just us and doing our own thing. See, when we mess up that picture, we distort the picture of God, that God is trying to give to humanity of his own character and his own love for us. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, 12 through 20, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and stomach for food, and the God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. <clears throat> Notice the link Paul makes here. The desire for food and the temptation to be dominated by it. And the comparison to sexual desire. Think of Esau and how he easily traded his birthright for a passing moment of hunger. A passing moment, I'm so hungry. And he sold it all away. A passing moment. We understand how this sums up sexual temptation. Paul continues in verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is judged, he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one with her? For it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Again, see the link of the picture of sexual intimacy and the way that we're supposed to be one with the Lord, who is called our bridegroom and we are his bride. The picture is consistent throughout Scripture. But you might say, well, how does that still make it the worst sin? Let's keep reading. 18. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Maybe you're tempted to say, well, my body, my choice. Well, apart from the obvious lie of abortion that's being played on our country right now, we know quite clearly that there are two lives involved there. It's not your body. And we know from Scripture that that is an innocent baby that is being formed in the womb beforehand that God knew. And so we are to pay attention. So listen to what Apostle Paul is speaking by the Spirit of the Lord. If that's still your claim, my body, my choice, listen to what he says here in 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Whom you have from God, you are not your own. For you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. You are not your own. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. How do you think that we can so easily grieve the Holy Spirit? He's inside us. He gets to see all your sins up close. We are the temple of the Lord. Sexual sins are always linked to great judgment in the Word of God, and this is why I personally believe America is in such obvious judgment today. This is why America doesn't know her right hand from her left and doesn't know male from female. This sin brings down kingdoms what brought down King David after all? What turned King Solomon's heart away from God? What's held up as the primary example of judgment in the Word of God? Sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. Did you guys know that the capstone of the book of Joshua is the very people of God repeating the same sins of Sodom? And this is why the tribe of Benjamin is nearly wiped out. This is why so many prophets in Israel call her a harlot and why Hosea is told to marry a prostitute. It was an example of the unfaithfulness of Israel that they were carrying out. See, God was continually pointing his people, finger at his people saying, this is how you are acting towards me. I want a bride, a pure bride, and you have turned away. 
Think of why so much of the imagery of the book of Revelation has to do with judging the harlot. And then at the end of time, what happens? God receives a pure bride. See, church, you are the bride of Christ. You don't get to act that way. I don't get to act that way. See to it that this is not occurring in your midst. You are supposed to care about holiness. Unfaithfulness is idolatry, and it's refusing to be self-controlled and submitted to God. We understand how unfaithfulness can destroy a marriage. And now listen to this last verse in my section this morning. The writer of Hebrews records, verse 17, For you know that afterwards, when he was rejected, he found no change, chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Though he sought it with tears, act, Esau's actions were so gross and selfish that he could not find forgiveness. See, we understand why this sin ends so many marriages and even why crying about it afterwards doesn't really help. Now, I pray for us today, if anyone who's experienced a divorce or an unfaithful spouse, you understand that in Christ you have forgiveness and mercy and restoration. And we are to help one another receive that grace if any of us are feeling guilty for that sort of thing. But we have to understand God gives a standard for a reason. He wants us to pursue Him. Now, Consider the context of this book. What are the Hebrews being tempted with? Abandoning the faith for greener pastures. Because a moment of extreme pressure is felt from the persecution. And so understand that turning your back on God is a big deal. This is why this book has so many warnings of apostasy. But don't let a momentary affliction take your heart, your peace, or your purity before God. Because it is true, when the day of reckoning comes, there will be many tears. Many people will perhaps re revert to their form of belief, but I did pray the prayer at some time. Or others who made excuses will continue to make them. Or maybe they'll point to their works. I did good works. Or others will claim there wasn't enough e evidence, but Jesus will say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. Let me read this, Matthew 7, 21 to 23. I've, I've referred to this as the scariest verse in the Bible. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Listen to this. You workers of lawlessness. They did not change. They did not become the people of God that he wanted them to become. What's Jesus saying here? You may be doing, th be doing things in my name, but you did not turn from your fallen state. You had no interest in peace. You had no interest in purity. You had no interest in addressing the bitterness in your heart. And you continued to walk in darkness. You continued to work lawlessness. We love name-dropping Jesus, but holiness, wow, that's legalism. Let me read Paul here. Romans 6, 1-4. What shall I say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that you have been baptized into Christ and, were, and baptized into His death? We were buried therefore with Him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Jesus wants mature believers who follow after him, not people that just name drop Jesus. Unfortunately, there are consequences for refusing discipline by God. Friends, do you understand that there are some even today in the Christian community who would say that I have been preaching works righteousness this morning, legalism. Maybe some today are thinking that. But I would simply say, if your definition of legalism means you ignore the clear calling from Scripture to walk in newness of life, pursue holiness, then you're not listening to God. Your vision might be clouded. See, one of the warnings from Randy's passage last week is, if you aren't being disciplined by God, you just might be an illegitimate son. So are we being disciplined by what the Word of God says? Are we letting it check our hearts and bring us into that faithful walk of sanctification? He justifies, but He calls us to a life walking after Him. But God loves us. Yes, He does, but how does He love us? 
Remember Matt Randy's passage? He disciplines the children that he loves. This problem of sin was killing us and it continues to kill the whole world, but it will continue to trip us up if we aren't even striving for peace and holiness. But there's good news. Let me read this. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. It'll take a minute to get to the good news. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkard, nor the revilers, nor the swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Here's the good news. And such were some of you. They were like that and they were changed. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. Yes, there are some things that if you take on as an identity and a life practice will mean you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And this, hint is, this verse is hinting even if you cry about it. This is why the church has the audacity to speak into people's sexual lives. You think we like talking about this? <laughs> I don't. I, w I wish that there wasn't texts in like this in there. But it's because I am called to proclaim the kingdom of the Lord. We are called to proclaim the gospel. We are to preach the kingdom of heaven and that is our mes message here. And the message is hope because we're all in that situation in one way or another. That's the point. We're all in that situation at one way or, in one point, way or another. And only God can deliver us. See, the message here is hope. Paul says, such were some of you, you can be changed. And the message this morning is we can all be changed as we are willing to be discipled by God. So we all have to ask ourselves, am I willing to be discipled by God? Or will I make excuses? See, our job, my job this morning is not to judge you, but to speak the truth because I want to see to it that you receive the grace that God is offering. But to receive that grace, we have to humble ourselves. We must come and humble ourselves. Remember the context here. Jesus Christ is the example here, and he suffered more than any of us could imagine. He is our Redeemer. His death covers our sins. And so the reminder is don't give in for a moment, passing moment of pleasure. Certainly do not give in for a moment of serenity and sell out your faith as he's writing to the Hebrews. And neither cower to those demanding you acquiesce to their decided form of social justification as we are seeing today, forming a bitter society all around us. See, our justification comes from the Lord. Our right standing with God comes from him. So don't let this veil of tears move you away from your first love. Do you want to be healed? Then lift up your head to Jesus. Keep your eyes on the author and perfecter of your faith. You have to ask yourself, are you willing to be trained by God? And that means after we're forgiven, we walk after him. He wants disciples who seek peace and desire holiness. He wants a pure bride. See, this place should be a sanctuary. Sure, we struggle, but we should be here seeing to it that one another are obtaining that grace. I hope you're not hearing, man, if Gabe found out I was struggling, he would just, like, no. If you repent, God is looking to love and for us to encourage and build one another up. I have to check my heart, too. We all have to. This place should be a sanctuary because we are the body of Christ and we are the bride of Christ, but let us be a pure bride. God desires a pure bride. So come here and experience the forgiveness of Jesus and the welcome of the saints. And if any of us are struggling, reach out for aid, please, that we might help one another receive that grace. Because the Spirit is at work, and we are to strive for holiness, because I want to see God. Do you want to see God? Do you want to experience? Don't shortchange yourself of the daily grace available to you because you're making excuses. I want to see God, and God wants peace with you, and He desires holiness. He wants to be seen by us, but will we look to Him? So I want to, I have a conclusion here. I didn't leave a space for it on your paper, but it's be a legitimate child of God, and therefore allow yourself to be discipled by Him. 
Be a legitimate child of God and therefore allow yourself to be discipled by Him. One more time. Be a legitimate child of God and therefore allow yourself to be discipled by Him. I want to close this morning reading something that Paul writes in Romans 15 kind of as a benediction and then we will pray. In 15, 14, he writes this, Paul, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. But on some points, I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Do you guys want your offering to be sanctified? Then we need to come under the instruction of God. Let's pray this morning. Father God, we come before you today, Lord, acknowledging, as Randy said last week, discipline is never enjoyable, but it produces a weight of righteousness. It produces and sets us up for grace. Lord, I pray today, Lord, that we would desire to be legitimate children, Lord, allowing ourselves to be dis discipled by you. God, I pray for any of us, Lord, if this has touched our lives, if, if it is, or a family member, or we're struggling, God, I pray that we would repent, that we would come to you, Lord, seeking forgiveness. And I thank you so much that you are a loving God, Lord, who is waiting with arms wide open. Let us be children that run to you. Let us be those, God, that do not fail to obtain the grace. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for telling us ahead of time so we're not surprised. We love you so much, Lord. Thank you for being our Father. Help us to be a pure bride. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a blessed week, guys. Thank you for listening to this message from Grace Point, an evangelical free church in Tucson, Arizona. Feel free to make copies of this message to give away to others, but please don't alter the content in any way without permission. We invite you to visit our website at www.gracepointtucson.org.